We're in the Aquarian age and the Aquarian age is be yourself. The old system was 2000 years of everyone trying to pretend they were normal. I'm telling you, it was a setting on the dryer. It was some notion that if you wore the little suit and you went to the corporation and you stayed in the same job and you pretended you weren't who you were, you would get success. And then came the sixties and they went, Drugs and alcohol and astrology and woo-woo and metaphysics and chakras and human design. And oh my God, all these things got introduced that are so crazy. Why? Because we're desperate to be individuals now. What's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of Your Superior Self. Today, I have a fascinating guest, Miss Deborah Silverman, on the show. We were just discussing how she got here because we have no clue, right? Um, I was telling her that I was in a uh, parking lot picking up my wife's groceries, and I stumbled upon her interview with um, I heard I don't really know her first name, but I think it's Blue Deja Blue Podcast, and they were talking about uh, her story and her journey. And next to me pulls up a blue car. Don't really know the brand, but a picture of Bluey was on the back. And my youngest daughter loves Bluey. So I was like, all right, start paying attention. Started listening to her show. And then they start talking about some fascinating phenomena, uh, particularly two blue beings. And then this morning before the conversation, she posts on Instagram, uh, today's horoscope and it's a blue being. So I'm like really fascinated right now. So Deborah, thank you for taking the time. A blue being. It's a funny story because if you remember during that podcast, I came out and revealed that I had had a very unusual experience at young age with a visual kind of hallucinating visual dream state that included someone sitting next to me who was blue. <laughs> she was blue and liquid. It was such a scary kind of vague strange, unfamiliar experience. And I hadn't hardly ever told anyone. And when I said blue, the woman was blue. And then I looked at blue. I was like, what? Mm. So this is all to say that um, I'm looking at your chart and how grounded you are. This is a very non-grounded conversation about the intergalactic presence on this planet of beings who we can't see, nor do we understand them. What I would never assume to say I do. And yet there can't be denial that there's an interface between invisible worlds and the physical world that doesn't make sense logically because we can't see it in the physical plane. And at the same time, how dare we imagine that we're the only ones that are here and that we're not being watched. I was just listening. I just flew on a plane yesterday to a podcast that I did with Zach Bush. Do you know who he is? I love Zach. Yeah. And he, I quoted him as I listened to the podcast. I hadn't heard it since I'd done it. And he said, in no uncertain terms, that we are being watched. So I don't doubt that. And I'm willing to suspend at this moment in time where before I was super practical and grounded. And you know, I've got a master's in clinical psychology and I've been this normal therapist. I don't know if anyone would use the word normal, <laughs> it's just a setting on the dryer. I don't know what that word means, but I definitely have had an opening in the last, you know, really since meeting Blue, where I am not so um, self-conscious about admitting that there's an interface going on. And while I can't see it, I definitely know spirit talks to us. Sure. Well, you you mentioned earlier to me that you're operating on this whole another level, right? Like, was it Blue's conversation that took you to that next level? Or was that prior to that? Yeah, I, no, no, I would say it was Blue's conversation. I would say that um, something happened in my encounter with her in that she did an incredible podcast. If any of you want to go watch it, it's how I met Trey in the first place. Um, I would say that she's an activation portal. That's something about her presence. While at first I, I honestly, and I then I did her on my podcast and I judged her. I told her straight up. I thought she was Kumbaya. I was like, really, are we going to sing Kumbaya next? But as I've gotten to know her, it's she's as far away from Kumbaya as you can get. Do you know her work? I know some of her work. Yeah. I, I started watching more of her work after watching your episode. Right. Um, and I just fell in love with your conversation. I love your energy. You're, I'm, I'm very attracted to your energy and uh, just some of the things and points that you uh, talked about, like really pulled my soul towards you. Right. Like um, 
I, astrology, like I, I admitted, like I, I don't, I've never had a reading. I don't, I really don't know the terminology too much. Um, but I was very fascinated with that, just being uh, in the counseling program, like how that all plays, in, you know, comes into play with our archetypes and personas. So, um, yeah, I just, I, the whole, the whole conversation was fascinating. I think what you were probably attracted to is you're so practical. Your chart is super practical. Like everything for you is ground, reality, follow through, doing things and saying them, meaning what you say, calling yourself out when you're full of shit. Like you've really got that practical side. And astrology is supposed to be completely woo-woo. I mean, everyone accuses astrology of being a parlor trick and that no one even believes in it. And yet my practice this lifetime has been how do I make it real? In fact, I'm writing a book called I Don't Believe in Astrology <laughs> because there's so many people that don't believe in it. And then I have the ability because of my fascination with the humans on their terms. Like, mm -hmm. I don't want to um, get lost in esoteric, philosophical, spiritual kumbaya. I want people to finish reading my book, taking my classes. <clears throat> I have written a book called The Missing Element, which is called, the subtitle is Compassion for the Human Condition. Like, how do we accept that we are <clears throat> such a strange race, species, and and be able to articulate it, you know, with language of, of, of using astrology? Sure. Um, I've always, I've been fascinated recently after reading your book, The Missing Element, right? Oh, um, good. Like, I wonder what the Ascended Masters chart would look like, right? Like, what would Buddha or Jesus, like, what would, like... What would that look like? Oh my God, no one has ever said that sentence before. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't even know, right? Like, that's a isn't great it heaven is heaven. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I would say that the projection, I, well, first of all, they know Buddha's birthday. So he was born under Taurus, like you. He was a Taurus with a full moon in, in Scorpio. And his whole message is, which is Taurus's life lesson. Don't be attached, that all suffering comes from attachment, that you think you should own things, you should think you should be perfect, you think that someone should be yours, you think that someone hurts your heart because they leave you. All of that is your, <laughs> don't go, that's Taurus. So Buddha came under that influence and then broke that bondage and said, meditate, release yourself of the gravitate gravitational pull of this existence and let yourself sit still and watch God's will. Ooh, it rhymed mm. yourself sit still watch god's will and stop being so pushy so that was we know buddha's birthday jesus they say is during christmas <laughs> i not, think so that no 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 that was hallmark they just said listen it's cold out we're gonna go sell a lot of presents a lot of cards let's do that and actually i think jesus's birthday i think he was a pisces mm -hmm. he was a fisherman and his whole message which is very piscean is turn the other cheek don't be so caught in right and wrong. Two Pisces is two fish going in opposite directions. It's the one sign that transcends this right and wrong notion. So he gave us the gift of stop. Well, it's a joke because all we do is judge. But he said, stop judging. And Buddha, the Taurus, is all about attachment and security and wanting things their way and money and stashing money under the bed. And then Taurus, uh, Buddha said, Stop being so attached. So you can see, that's a great question. The ascended masters, those two particularly that arrived on earth, came under the influence of an archetype. No one's ever asked me that before. I just love that conversation. Um, and then there's people like, you probably don't know, Alice Bailey, a woman mm -hmm. that wrote 23 books. She, in the 19, early 1900s, for about 10 years, she channeled these books that have become esoteric law. And she was a Gemini. How perfect. She was the conduit. Gemini is the connection between the heaven and earth. It's the Roman numeral two. So it has, she was able to listen and then manifest by writing these books. So that she was a master. She would never call herself that. She was a channel. Um, but your point is, of course, the, the astrological influences take over when you land in a body. Jesus is not operating with archetypes when he's on the other plane, nor is Buddha or Alice Bailey. But when you land in this physical plane, it is completely dictated by archetype and by a, a, a matrix and a grid. And once you know astrology, you can describe your kids in such detail that you're like, oh, well, this kid doesn't talk and that kid doesn't stop. 
Well, that makes sense. Why don't I support them being who they are rather than saying, stop talking, start talking? No, let them be who they are. Mm -hmm. That's why I love astrology and children. Sure. No, I think it, it helps us, like to your point in previous conversations, have more compassion for that, right? <clears throat> um, do you find it though, like sometimes that people, when they find out their chart, do they develop more attachment to that persona? Or do you think they transcend that a little bit more and have more freedom of being able to objectively observe? When you study astrology, you get more freedom. Is that the question? Sure. Yeah. Well, I mean like the persona, right? Like the archetype you, of it the It becomes Taurus. funny. It doesn't, listen, I can't stop being a Gemini. I can't help it. You can't stop being a Taurus. You can't stop drinking that drink. I mean, that that is, Taurus is a repetitive, controlled, wants it his way, loves it his way, and don't ask him to break out of his mold. Don't you repeat yourself a lot? Sure. That's a very Taurus trait. Now, if I said to you, stop doing that because you're studying astrology, uh-uh, you can't. You're as solid as a tree. If I said to you, just change your ways and be flaky and just decide you don't want to do that today, and you're you're like, oh, God. Same thing with me. If they tell me to stop talking, I'm like, excuse me? <laughs> oh, one thing I do want to say, right? <clears throat> and having a show that's like this, that definitely dives into the woohoo and the spiritual, spiritual side of the house, there are times where I just want to agree so much with someone. But I think you were talking to Robert Edward Grant, I think is his name. And he was talking about this concept of oneness and he was relating those through numbers and uh, everyone being a part of the one. And you're like, that's great. I love that. But that's still theory, right? I just love that about you, how you can still yeah. be objective about that. It, mm -hmm. My heart says, yes, I definitely want to be mm -hmm. one with the, with the, the one, but that's still just theory until I have that experience. Have you ever had anything close to that? That's such a great, great mm -hmm. question. Um, that's where you and I, where you were attracted, because we both have the same Mercury and Taurus, which means that we both think practically. I get really sick of spiritual schmeritual. It drives me out of my mind. There's a certain point where watching all the memes, listening to TikTok, looking on Instagram, watching YouTube, watching all these videos, and then I'm like, do you like your husband? Are you getting along with your kids? How are you dealing with your diet? What do you do with your money? Do you share it? Those practical questions transcend all that theory and bring you down to earth. So I'm with you. I, I have a high value for where does the tires hit the ground? Mm -hmm. How do people not talk theoretically and actually apply this medicine in real time? Not because to how much time do we spend doing this? All day. I had this joke recently that when people get to the other side and they're at the pearly gates, God turned to Michael or one of his good friends there. And he said, why are all the people standing there like this? <laughs> uh, I don't even look at Sunday reports anymore because it's just, it's bad. Like, you know, the, the report that you get at the end of the week that says, oh, your screen time's up or down, you know, X percent. Like, I'm like, I can't even look at that anymore. Yes. Because you're sick of it, right? Sure, I am, right? Um, but I get a lot of my, uh, I, I get a lot of my teachings that way too. Just you know, finding people like yourself that are doing this work that I had no idea about astrology, right? But I started watching your stuff, and I'm like, oh, that that makes sense to me, right? Like that, that these archetypes that Jung talked about, right? Like they're very, right. they're very. You no, know, Carl Jung is a, an astrologer. I didn't know that. And he was. He was quoted to say, astrology will be a dinosaur science until it includes astrology. Wow. I did not, I did not know that. Um, All those archetypes are based on astrology. That's where they came from. Hmm. Isn't that surprising? It is surprising. I didn't know that. I guess, like, to me, right? So that just kind of, have you ever heard of, like, simulation theory? Yes. Simulation theory is one of my favorite conversations that make me nuts. Make you nuts. Why? Because if that's true, if we are simply an action of a video game that's operative in someone's imagination, shoot me now. 
I'm not going to stay here and cry and be pained and be suffering and be learning and because there's no ultimate spiritual goal. I don't doubt, as I described when we started this, there's an external reflection of people watching us, influencing us, considering us, influencing us by the stars. And at the end of that story, please tell me that there's a divine influence here <laughs> that is intelligent and masterful and wise and compassionate and benevolent. Don't tell me I'm a simulation. I'm going to cry. Well, I mean, but the calculations, right? Everything is like calculated to the time that you're like, I gave you, I gave you everything about me, right? As far as my birth time, date, month, all of that. And you're able to come up with these archetypes that are very accurate, right? But that kind of scares me a little bit because it's like, does that mean this is a machine kind of thing, right? Where it can calculate and output something like takes a soul input and put makes an output of tray. And then I'm going to be you know, kind of, I have to bow down to this fate that I was given. So what I've said about you so far, has it been true? The practical, the grounded, the repetition, the stability? To a point, yes. But I'm finding myself becoming more like, this is outside of my comfort zone, having a conversation with you, right? Like so much. Like I'm, I was nervous coming in here. I was like, Deborah Silverman's coming on the show. I don't know how to act. I don't, I might <laughs> pee myself. I don't know. I don't. Well, just so you know, I felt the same way. I was looking at you going, where, who is this guy? <laughs> I thought you meant like the bad way. Like, who is this guy? Who is this fraud coming well, no, in here? I, just, I saw, I didn't know you. I hadn't heard of you. I hadn't seen your podcast. I just didn't do my, my team <clears throat> did the vetting. And I was left with, wait, it doesn't sound like he knows astrology or is interested. So I'm in awe of your openness because your chart does not suggest openness. It's uncomfortable for you to go to the unknown. Yes, it is very much so. But that's where I... I've learned so much, right? In the last year of like going outside of my comfort zone, it, I don't learn anything in my comfort zone, in my house, you know, hidden from reality. I learn it from the out, outside of that and like diving deep in the conversations that would normally make people like cringe, you know, like I love to experience, I feel like consciousness, if there's a one consciousness has like this spectrum for everyone, right? Like whether, whether you're in UFOs or astrology or channeling or past life regressions, whatever, it's all like that old saying, that metaphor, like all water leads back to the ocean, right? I feel like it's there to, to catch you and kind of pull you in and like dive deeper into who you are, like know thyself almost. It's a hundred percent right. So what was the scary part? Tell me what you were scared. Well, where does the discomfort come? I'm curious. Uh, Just with like my past programming, like subconscious stuff that pops up. Like when I have a conversation with someone like you so knowledgeable about something that I have no clue about, right? Like, am I going to ask the right questions? Am I going to, am I going to be able to make myself vulnerable enough to have a educated conversation about something I have no freaking clue about, right? And, but it still be powerful to the point where it motivates people to dive in and um, take a chance, if that makes sense. Exactly. So let me describe that in your chart. Um, you have a lot of earth, which you probably read. Did you read that in the book? I thought I identified with the water aspect of things. Yes, yes, exactly. So you've got a lot of water and a lot of earth. So you're super sensitive. That's what you're dealing with. Like you're a little vulnerable, not fun to admit. That's your <laughs> life lesson. Your life lesson is water. So you nailed it. And then the earth conversation is you're grounded, you're practical, evidence, stability, consistency. Don't surprise me. I don't like being out of control. And by the way, I live with insecurity. No one ever tells that about Taurus. They live with a low-grade insecurity that makes them feel less than, but it's not true. Mm -hmm. It's just that they're stable and they're boring and they're repetitive and they're consistent. And there's like, is that impressive? I don't have all the credentials. I don't have all the money. How could I be considered so valuable when I'm really just simple? Wrong answer. Buddha sat under a tree and got enlightened by doing nothing, but doing his inner work. And that's what your chart is about doing inner work, right? Working on those missing elements, right? To be the self-actualized individual. Exactly. To face your human condition. And this is what I'm addressing with you. To say out loud, I'm nervous. I'm afraid. All those vulnerable things that men never say is your promise. And by you role modeling for us, I'm scared. I'm not really comfortable. I feel self-conscious. That's the stuff, by the way, most people live with, but they never say it out loud. A Taurus is like, I'm not the only one. 
<laughs> I will definitely admit it, right? Like there, there are just times where, especially in this conversation where I'm very vulnerable right now, because it's not easy showing like, you know, your weaknesses to people like communicating for me as a water, right? Like I feel more than most, like I, I feel everything and I can feel your energy, right? Like I feel it and I love it and I want some more of it, but I don't know how to communicate it. Well, you're doing a pretty good job considering the fact that I'm here. Mr. Water, he has not stopped drinking since we got here. Hello. I know. I've been dehydrated. And it's also comfort. What Tauruses do is they create comfort in their life because they're vulnerable creatures. And I want to ask this question to the audience. What makes us self-conscious about being vulnerable? Hmm. I sat on the airplane yesterday crying my eyes out because someone passed away last week that I love deeply. And I... I have not been able to control myself. So I'm sitting on the airplane next to a man who's doing this. So I know he's super Christian. So I'm not telling him I'm an astrologer because that doesn't go over. We don't talk, but I, I am writing on my newsletter all about her. And I'm just like vulnerable, like exposing myself. And I've made a decision at the sweet age of 70,000 years old, which is how old I am, that I am never going to withhold my vulnerability because somebody told me to. So I'm going to ask the question again. What is it that has programmed your malehood to think that it's not okay to be uncomfortable? I think it's, you know, it's that that whole idea of like male sensitive therapies, right? Like societal influence, cultural, uh, personal. I think it's all of that intertwined into this, re this moment, right? And for me, I really, it's funny you bring this up because I've been diving deep into that, right? Um, uh, I, the wounded masculine right like being something we're not like and I, I think you're seeing my generation and the younger generations really bump up against that and want to break that and oh. and be the men that they want to be and come up with like i don't have words for some of the feelings that i have because of that that uh that mask that i wear that i have to be this this rough tough dude the stoic guy that comes in you know, the athlete I don't have words to describe some of the, the feelings that I have, right? Like love to me is, is a generic word sometimes because I, I use it to describe a lot of different things and to really, my work right now is to really dive into my feelings and, and kind of, kind of not categorize, but kind of understand them and feel them and know what they are. That makes sense. That makes total sense. Your life lesson is it's such a crazy story. I just looked at this chart of yours and you have Saturn in an air sign. So, so your life lesson is air and you are built for water, the compassion, the sensitivity. The, how, I can imagine how much you love your kids. I can only oh. imagine. They're my babies. Like we can make you cry in a minute if we oh, really. Yeah. Right. So, but your life lesson is permission to be awkward and not able to verbalize as a man, the depth of your love without feeling self-conscious. Mm. Now, when that happens, when men on this planet could stand up in front of each other and say, I'm sad, I'm happy. I watch my son has become very um, religious and it's allowing him to cry. And he said, since he's gotten spiritual, he's cried more in this last year than his whole life. And I thought, good for you. Like, I am so proud of you that you can cry. Now, that is so opposite of what my dad would have said to my brothers when I was growing up. So announcement, we're changing. The whole era has shifted. You are a, a spearhead. You are giving yourself permission to be honest. And your life lesson is using words, which is not your specialty. No, not at all. Not at all. Because um, I've, I've, my entire life, right, like growing up, it's always been be seen, not heard, right? And work hard and don't do anything that's going to make us or look stupid, right? Like, or yourself. And so I have basically just been quiet, hard worker. You haven't heard of me, right? Like until now, I've been silently working in the dark, putting this thing together. And now I'm here and I'm here to share that message. That guys, it's okay to cry. It's okay to feel love. It's okay to be confused. It's okay to be uncomfortable because on the other side of that is growth. And then a conversation with Deborah Silverman. I'm so proud of you.
If only the whole world were willing, this is what astrology does. It gives people permission to say, here's your life lesson. It's air. Can you talk? You are grounded and stable and shy and self-conscious until you age. You age really well. You're Capricorn rising. The older you get, the better. You were old when you were young and you're going to be young when you're old. <laughs> And meantime, when you were young, it was self-consciousness. So all of you Tauruses out there, you're getting a free class on you're the sign that lives with insecurity for no apparent reason. Absolutely. Isn't, isn't that wild? And the gift of the Taurus is if you're in someone's life, like your wife is so lucky and those kids, you'll take a bullet. You would do anything for those you're loyal to. Am I right? 100%. 100%. 100%. And you know how important that feeling is for most women that are watching this who say, I can't find a man who has my back. I can't find a man who's devoted to me. That's a, that is the right use of the new male is he's willing to admit that he's an emotionally responsive, loyal, promising his heart and doesn't move. That's what we're all longing for. Not at the expense of pretending he doesn't feel anything. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that wound. I have a lot of compassion. I've, I've often wanted to run men's liberation, but it seems inappropriate. <laughs> well, I feel a calling for that. Like, That's really, what you're doing. I, I really do feel a calling for that. Like I just, I started reading, we were, we were studying feminist theories and there was a subpart in that, in that chapter of male sensitive theories. And I was like, holy shit. Like I never felt more resonance than I did when I read that. I was like, I don't know how to describe who I am. I don't know how to, I don't know how to describe my love. And I've been pretending to be someone to be successful. And none of that was ever needed. Especially in like corporate America. Like I, I feel like the younger generation, like you're seeing that, like people are like, I don't want to go into the office. I, we don't need to be in person. Like we can be, we can be on zoom. We can do different things. Like, and I don't need to come wear a suit and a tie. Right. I want to be me. Like, but that old, old, old archetype of success is you need to be in person and you need to have a wear a tie and you need to do this and you need to be, you need to have this this stoic like facial expression and show no emotion and I want you to lead from the front and I want you to fire everyone. You know what I mean? Like I'm just like, no, like let's understand where people come from. Let's understand their their backgrounds, their cultures. Like let's let's see why they're doing the things they, they're doing. And understand, like, maybe they just see the world differently, right? Like, how do we make more companies see the world, see the world from a different perspective and not just one? It's the changing of the guards. Yeah. We are no longer playing in the old system that was based on contrived notions of everyone following the leader. We're in the Aquarian age and the Aquarian age is be yourself. The old system was 2,000 years of everyone trying to pretend they were normal. I'm telling you, it was a setting on the dryer. It was some notion that if you wore the little suit and you went to the corporation and you stayed in the same job and you pretended you weren't who you were, you would get success. And then came the 60s and they went drugs and alcohol and astrology and woo-woo and metaphysics and chakras and human design. And oh my God, all these things got introduced that are so crazy. Why? Because we're desperate to be individuals now. Hmm. I love With, that. Yes. And you're doing it. Yes, ma'am. I got to ask you this though, right? You're the master of astrology, essentially. Like, and you, you what, did, what did you say on blue? The OG, she I'm called you the OG. Of I the, thought the it was an old gangster, but I found that it was the original gangster and I've turned into an OG. I had no idea. <laughs> <laughs> but knowing that, right. And knowing all the charts and knowing all the archetypes, right. Have you found out who you are inside? Definitely. I mean, I'm almost 70. So I've, I'm moving towards maturity. And there comes a time when, to your point, that the outer persona, the way that we present to the world, what we were programmed to present with, according to our family and our idea of our identity, it suddenly gets really tired. Like, like I can't play. Now I do have kids and I do play house and I do have, you know, family members. And I've had to say to them, there's no more of that, Deborah. And so now the inner part of me has come forward, which means, ready, it's so contrary to what I was. I'm an introvert. I had no idea. I don't socialize well. I had no idea because my personality was so capable. 
and everybody liked having me at the party. I realized all those years of me pretending was not true. And now my inner self, to your point, your question is in full bloom. And she's a little bit of a bitch. You know, she's not as friendly as the other one. She's not as generous in the name of pretending. She's way more generous financially. She has way less attachments to what people think. So there's been a radical adjust to your back, back to changing of the guards. I played normal. I went to graduate school. Such a funny game. And I, I didn't tell them in the beginning. I didn't say I'm an astrologer. I started this at 20 years old. Mm -hmm. I was an astrologer when I came out of the womb. I knew it like a kid would play piano and they would automatically play piano when they never had a lesson. That's what happened to me with astrology. I never had, I had one teacher for three days in a car. <laughs> it's a funny story. And then I had a dream. And in the dream, they told me, screamed at me, you've been an astrologer for lifetimes, stupid. Stop acting so dumb. And I woke up and started charging people. <laughs> I had a crazy dream the other night, right? Um, there, My daughter and I were walking through, I can't believe I'm saying this. Um, we were walking through a neighborhood and there was like this fence, like a, a waist high fence. And inside the fence were, were rabbits, right? Full size rabbits. And so we're feeding the rabbit and she drops some uh, food on the outside of the fence. And there's like this little hole, right? And I'm like, oh shit. So I go down and I pick up this food. And next thing you know, this rabbit pops out like, like huge rabbit. And I'm like, how in the world did this thing get out? But then it like turns around, grabs the food and goes right back in. I'm like, it just had freedom. Like it just like it could have gone anywhere it wanted to, but it chose to go back inside the fence. And I had this knowing this. It was like, you do the same thing. It's like we get so comfortable in our own little worlds of our own little programs that we never, we never when introduced with freedom, we don't know what to do with it. And we get scared and we go back to our comfort zones. That was the most beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. Dreams are a language of the unconscious that stimulate the thought that you just had. If you're willing, I love telling the story that there was a woman that had a dream and her boyfriend who didn't play golf in the dream, he was playing golf and he pulled out his pole and his balls and he didn't have any balls. And she told me the story and I said, excuse me, he doesn't have any balls. <laughs> That's the kind of language that a dream requires you to say it out loud. The When you say it out loud, it sounds crazy. The rabbit jumped through the hole, went back in and then your awareness came on and went, Oh, just like you. Yes. You back in and how profound. profound. And that and the dream that told me I was an astrologer at the age of 20 and I had no training, I had no astrology teacher, it's hysterical. And the next thing I knew, I, I mean I shouldn't tell people that. Did I study over years and years and years? Did I do readings from that moment forward for free to every single person I met? Yes. Did I become the OG because I went to graduate school and said to my professor, I'm going to go do a research project on mental illness and astrology. And she was like, you're going to do what? <laughs> 1982, when no one ever heard of that and didn't know at that time that Carl Jung was an astrologer. It was a secret because sure. this whole world has been left behind. Well, changing of the guards, new system, Aquarian age is here. And to your point, don't put your rabbit back in that hole. Give yourself some freedom. Yes. Let the dream world, let the invisible world, let the language of the unconscious, said Carl Jung, which is why if you look at his red book, have you ever seen the red book? Mm -mm. It's a book this big, it's $500. It was all of his dreams and all of his interpretations and it's big and it's fat and it's expensive and it tells you the entire trajectory of his unconscious mind, which was crazy. But he gave us the gift to know that yes, the unconscious can be understood when you say the dreams out loud. Everyone always says my dream world is crazy. No, it's not. You just don't understand crazy. You know, it's funny and actually pretty crazy to your no balls dream. Um, my daughter literally just got done telling all her friends that I have no balls because I had the surgery, right? Like to get snipped. And I don't know if she heard me like saying that, uh, you know, I, I'd got my balls cut off or whatever. Right. But she told all of her friends that. And like, so like, I've been getting weird looks from all of her, like all of their parents. And I'm just like, I don't not thinking anything of it. And then a mom comes up to my wife and says that. And I just, I was like, great. And then you say that I'm just like, Holy crap. Like this entire well, this conversation. Carl Jung called synchronicity, the blue on your shirt, the blue in the car, the blue sitting next to you. This is what Carl Jung wrote his whole body of work. And so did Richard Tarnas, a very famous astrologer, wrote a whole book about Eros and Cosmos, which is 
Synchronicity is at play all the time if you're paying attention. And more comes to you, right? When you pay attention, like when you start seeing that, like how does astrology play into that, right? Like, does it, does it have any influence on synchronicities at all? Like to your, to your uh, experience? Once you, well, I'll tell you in my lifetime, it happened just yesterday when I was at a store and I'd forgotten that I'd left something I wanted to buy and we were busy the whole day. And then at the very last minute I said, wait, we have to go back. And as they were closing the doors, it was six o'clock. She looked at me and she said, you can come in. And I said to my friend, that's called synchronicity. The fact that we got there without remembering a thing at the dot when the clock went to six, that's synchronicity. And that is a symptom of a person being willing to acknowledge the invisible world, to pay attention when you see 1111, to pay attention when your daughter says balls, when I say ball, when you say blue, when I say blue, and start paying attention with the awareness that says, I'm humble. I know I don't know. Einstein said it the best. The more I know, the more I know I don't know. That's a Taurus dream sentence. You don't have to know. In the innocence and the vulnerability and the ability to not be spiritual, <laughs> That's a really funny thing for me to say, because of course, the people that watch my podcast and follow me, they're all spiritual. But I'm saying to everyone, let go of that word and go back to innocence. Let your dream time, let your own dialogue of your profound wisdom, I call it the observer in my book, turn on the observer, become aware that there's some part of you watching you. Like right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And once the awareness is on, my awareness is on in this moment. You start to pay attention to the room you're in. Let's all do it together as we're on this podcast. Take a deep breath. Turn on your awareness and pretend there's a camera behind your head and it can see the behind you, it can see the camera, the computer. Now put the camera on in front of you and it can see the back of the computer and it can see what you're wearing. Now put the camera on the right of you as though you had a cameo of just a profile of your face. And now put the camera on the left. Now you're outside yourself right now. The camera just activated the observer watching you from a distance. If you could live with that awareness on, synchronicity will become very obvious because you're not caught in your mind. You're not caught in the noise factory. You're not caught in the distractions. You're letting yourself step out, take a conscious deep breath. And suddenly there's a softness that occurs. If people, I have taught people, and this is my new book, how do you put your awareness on your own chart? So if I were you, Trey, and I had three planets in Taurus, my awareness would come on and I'd say, oh, I live with insecurity for no reason. That's good to know. Hmm. That just softened the pressure of me feeling bad about myself. Oh, I have my life lesson. One of my lessons is water. I feel everything. Oh, I'm doing that right now. I felt Deborah in that video in that podcast. So the awareness allows a distant position from the ego's compulsion behavior of, and then from that moment on, astrology, the human design, the, what is she called? The um, gene keys, the, um, what is it? I was going to say the endocrine system, the Enneagram, all these systems that are being put in place right now by the advanced beings, you start to watch yourself. And then it becomes endearing. It becomes sweet. It becomes cute. It becomes a smile rather than <gasps> I'm anxious. I'm depressed. I'm self-conscious. All that is the ego's grip that doesn't have any loosening. It's like the story of the bunny rabbit jumping back in the hole. Come on out here with me. Sit in the world where there's this thing called the observer. And that's what my life's work. That's what my school does. You should, if you just take level one every year, twice a year, in January and September, we have a school. It's only six weeks. It's once a week. There's 10 people in the class. It's very intimate. And you study your own chart and you are going to flip out, Trey. You're going to be like, I didn't want to believe it because you're so <laughs> earth. I don't like this stuff. It scares me, but it's so true. <laughs> Absolutely. I have to ask you though. Um, what is my midheaven? Cause that's the only thing I know at this point. Where did you get that word? Uh, one of your, one of your interviews or shows. You're going to love when I tell you this, what your midheaven is. I hope so. Rise. It's water. Hmm. You're a Scorpio. You're a healer. You came in this life to deal with people's dark sides and be the example for other people to be able to heal their secret self. Water is secrets. And your higher self or your mission, the rise, the midheaven is called 
the top of the chart. It's literally the zenith. When your mom was born, what was on the very top of the heavens at the exact height? And yours was Scorpio. So it tells me that your purpose this life, as far as your career, is to be therapeutic and to heal people. Wow. That's so amazing. Deborah, my love, thank you so much for taking the time to hang out with me today and manifest this conversation. And yeah, we, we've been brought here for a reason. I think there's a lot of synchronicities and I think Carl Jung would be very proud of us in this conversation. So how can people connect with you? Carl Jung is giving me a pat on the back. Yeah, he is. It's just three words, Deborah, D-E-B-R-A, Deborah Silverman Astrology. You can go to my Instagram, to YouTube. There's these very funny videos. You have to go watch them. Did you see this yet? On YouTube, mm -hmm. if you put in Deborah Silverman Taurus, a little five-minute video will come on, and you're going to laugh so hard. <laughs> you would watch, if you were going to do your chart, you would watch Taurus, because, of course, that's your um, sun sign, and your moon is in Aries. You'd watch Aries, and then you'd watch Capricorn. Those are your three pillars. So you want to write that down. Taurus, Aries, Capricorn. And just go watch those three five-minute videos, and you are going to... And let your wife watch, and then go watch your wife and your kids, and it's going to give you all this insight. Sure. Deborah, this has been amazing. Thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you. I don't even know how I found you, but I'm so glad. Mm -hmm.